Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for a virtual time of worship together. We're going to sing uh, some songs and we'd invite you to join in and sing along with us. Or some of the, the beauty and the value of uh, being separated from a screen is wherever you're at, you could just take a moment to sit and reflect and receive from the Lord as we sing these songs over you, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, we're just glad that we're in this together right now and grateful that you've joined us. Let's sing and worship.
Cause you take good care of me You take good care of me You know what I need Before I even ask a thing You hold me in your hand With a kindness that never ends I'm carried in your love No matter what the future brings Yeah, you take good care of me The sun's not running out the winter Cause soon it will pass The light's not thinking about the darkness Or the shadow we cast A heart that's planted in forgiveness Doesn't dwell your kindness I know there's got to be more but I can't get past your goodness I know there must be more but I can't get past your kindness I know there's got to be more but I can't get past your take good care of me you take good care of me you know what I need before I even ask a thing you hold me in your hands the kindness that never ends I'm carried in your love no matter what the future brings continues to be uh, an interesting time that we find ourselves in, um, meeting today virtually and grateful for technology that affords us that right and opportunity. Um, you know, wading through the last few weeks, wading through the holidays, navigating COVID, navigating um, School closures for those of us who are in Central Virginia. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in that place before where, where you feel like you need a break from a break. You know, sometimes I've heard of people who they finally find their stride when they're on vacation and they um, realize that like it's almost time to go home by that time. And so 
I've found myself over the last few weeks just coming to a place where, where I realize, okay, I've got some downtime here, um, and is it enough? And at the end of that time, what am I going to have left? Am I going to be recharged enough? You know, a question that I think uh, we all probably come to is, um, it, it is what I have enough? You know, I, I grew up in going through school, in middle school, high school, doing pretty well and uh, getting really good grades, got into a good college. When I went off to college, I realized that it was m a much bigger investment, much harder than what I was used to. And I was putting so much pressure on myself and struggling to get good grades there and would call home, talk to my mom and, and be... Uh, in tears over what was what was happening because I, I wasn't getting the grades that I thought I should. And, and I remember one time calling and, and my mom saying to me, have your dad and I ever put pressure on you, John, to perform at, at a certain level? She said, all we ever ask is for you to, to do your best and to give um, your best in something. And she said, are you are we putting pressure on you? I said, no. And she said, well, then all the pressure that you're putting on is really your own. And um, I don't know if you've ever been there before, if you've been in that place where you, you feel all this pressure. And when you stop to, to think about it, the pressure that's being put on is not so much from people around you. It, it's, it's yourself. It's, it's you putting that pressure on yourself. And, and I think when that happens, we, we can easily fall victim to listening to the voices around us that are telling us, hey, you're not enough, or you can be enough if uh, you give this or, or you give that. And they tell us that we need to be bigger, better, cooler, faster, whatever it, it might be. And yet, are we listening to what God's telling us we need to be? Is, are we listening to God tell us whether or not we're enough? And we're getting ready to jump into a series next week on identity. And, and Drew walked us through a message last week. And, and again, this week we're, we're preparing uh, for that identity series and with, with a word that I think is helpful for us as we can, we'll be considering who we are, and uh, how we really uh, determine our own identity. I think there are lessons that, that we can learn. And, and in addition to looking at this today, we're also uh, going to be hearing some stories from people about um, serving. You know, the Sunday right after Christmas, we, um, we didn't meet in person here at the branch. Instead, I... I handed out and emailed out a list for people of, of suggestions and opportunities that people might take to serve their neighbors, serve the people around them. And hopefully people had a chance to do that. Uh, some people have, have sent me information about it. Some people have sent me videos. We're going to have those uh, right after this message. So, um, but in the meantime, uh, I want us to look at, at a, a story, an account in John's gospel in the sixth chapter that I think will be helpful for us uh, as we recover from the holidays, as we prepare ourselves for, for 2022, uh, and then as we as a community dig into this idea of identity. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to that, uh, and to John chapter 6. Reading, uh, starting in verse 1. It says, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. And Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat. 
He asked us only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five barley loaves and two small fish. How far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves. He gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. And so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the signs Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. You know, I'm a, a big story fan. I love to read. I love to watch movies. And the stories that always attract me are stories that are underdog stories, where the least likely of people ends up uh, being used in a phenomenal way. And if you had stopped to, to assess the situation before you jumped into that story and thought to yourself, who is it that will be the hero here uh, the person who ends up being the hero is the person that you probably uh, would least expect that to happen. Um, I, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to become a hero. Even if I, am, I can pretty much guarantee you that uh, I will be a fairly unlikely hero. I, I especially like those stories when the unlikely hero shows up the one who thinks that they've got it all together. You know, I, I love it when um, people who are unassuming and humble uh, end up showing up the person who's proud and arrogant and egotistic. And this story in, in John's Gospel, I think, is an example of that. It's an example of not so much the egotistic, arrogant types, but the, the unassuming, unlikely hero in the story. You know, imagine for yourself what's, what's happening here as we read through this account, that Jesus and his disciples are being followed by people. You know, they've seen and heard about Jesus' miracles, and so they want a first-hand glimpse of that. And so they're following him. And there are literally thousands of people who are there waiting. And it gets to that point where, you know, you've got thousands of people. They're starting to get hungry. And, and Jesus, to test his disciples to see, you know, kind of what they're made of, he said, you know, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to feed these people? And it's interesting because right away we've got Philip who, who steps up and said it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for everyone here to eat. And you see, Philip fell victim to one of the greatest errors that I think we can fall victim to. It's when we bring ourselves to Jesus and we look at whatever it is that we have through our own lens. We look at the situation and we say, this is it. Like, this is all I've got. You know, my wife Carrie and I talk about this in terms of having a, a scarcity mindset versus an abundance mindset. I've heard other people say the same thing before as well. That you have this opportunity to look at a situation from a scarcity perspective, from a scarcity mindset, or from an abundance mindset. And you see, Philip, when Jesus asks him that question, he comes looking at things from a scarcity perspective. From, hey, what do we not have? And I think there's, there's two kinds of scarcity that we see. You know, the first kind is, 
is looking at what we don't have. It seems pretty obvious that we'll say, hey, look, I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't have that. That's a scarcity mindset. The, the second type of scarcity mindset is, is not necessarily looking at what we don't have, but it's limiting ourselves and what we do have. It's saying, this is all that I have. This is it. And saying to ourselves that, hey, you know what? Like, like this is all I have, so I better hold on to it because if I get rid of this, if I give this up, then what's there going to be, what will be left for me? And both of those are scarcity mindset. Both of those are looking at things strictly from our own perspective. I think sometimes we can get to that place where we so passionately hang on to what we have in fear of the day that we might not have anymore. And golly, if there's ever a time in my life that I've seen fear winning the day, it's, it's today. That we're so overcome by what if that, that we can't live into what is. And we're being paralyzed by that fear. You know, Philip was calculating out how much they would need and how much it would cost. But he was doing it all in his own strength. And, and along comes a boy to Andrew, Peter's brother, with five loaves and two fish. Two small fish at that. And it's interesting to see this unlikely hero because you've got Philip who's been hanging out with Jesus, seeing firsthand all the things that Jesus has been doing. And then you've got this little boy, and all he knows is when I left my house today, this is what my mom gave me. I mean, be the equivalent of saying like, hey man, I got my peanut butter and jelly sandwich here and a juice box and an apple. And I'm going to bring this to the Lord. And the difference between this little boy and Philip is their perspective and whose hands they were seeing this food in. You see, Philip was looking at everything from his own perspective. We don't have. It would take. You know, I mean, this is the language that he's using. And he's saying that uh, there's no way that we can uh, make this happen. We just don't have the resources, and he's looking at himself and the other 11 disciples, and he's limiting himself to that. And I wonder how many times do we look at what's missing rather than simply taking what's there and making the best of it? I'm going to say that again because I think it's really, really important for us, especially as we jump into a new year how many times do we look at what's missing, what's not there, what we don't have, rather than simply taking what's there and making the best of it? You know, I think we're creating a generation behind us of, of entitled kids with unreasonably high expectations that will most likely never be met. We're setting them up for disappointment in, in the areas of relationships and education, in finance, and in jobs and occupation, and loads of other areas. Because instead of saying, hey, what do you have and what can you make of it? We're saying, hey, look at all you don't have and long for that. I think when it comes to serving God, God's not asking us what we don't have. I mean, yes, fathers, and we see this in Scripture, that, that our Father wants to hear from us when, when we have a request, when we have a desire. But I think the one question that God is asking us, especially when it comes to serving Him, is, is what do you have to give? He's not asking what don't you have that somebody else has. He asked, isn't asking what's missing, 
that's not allowing you to give what you'd like to give. He's saying, what is it that I've given you that you have to give back to me? You know, this little boy, he had five loaves and two fish, and he brought it. He gave it to Jesus, and that was it. And I wonder, what is it that we're bringing? Are we trying to find something more? Are we trying to just bring what we have, to give what we have? I think the thing that keeps us from bringing what we have often is the other question that we ask ourselves. When we stop, and if we answered that question that Jesus asked us, what do you have to give? I think the next question that he doesn't ask us, but that we ask ourselves, is, is it enough? And we wonder to ourselves, is this really enough? And I think the answer to that question is really dependent on another part of that question. We ask ourselves, if, if God asks us, what do you have to give? We say, this is what I have to give. And we ask ourselves, is it enough? The next question that we really have to ask ourselves to answer that is, in whose hands? In whose hands is this enough? You see, when we take what we have and we look at it in our own hands, it may look grossly inadequate and insufficient. But whose hands are we supposed to see it in? Not ours. When, when we look at what God's given us and we say, is it enough? Again, not a question that I think God is asking us. If it's not enough, then I think we're looking at it in our own hands. We haven't placed it yet in God's hands. You see, this little boy, he came with five loaves, two fish. And if he had looked at it in his own hands, he would have said, how on earth can these five loaves and two fish feed all of these people? Is it enough? But he didn't do that. You see, he saw those fish and those loaves, not in his own hands, but in the hands of the one who had created it all. He saw them in God's hands. And once he saw past his own hands, limited, insufficient, inadequate as they were, and he saw them in Jesus' hands, all of a sudden he said, yes, this is enough. And Jesus proved that. Because Jesus multiplied what was there and he gave it out. I think one of the biggest hindrances that we have in serving God is looking at things and never looking beyond what they look like in our own hands. We only see things in our hands. What can I do with this? How much do I have? Rather than saying, what can God do with this? What can God do with what I've given? If we never move things out of our hands and into the hands of Jesus, we will never see them for what they could be. And I think that's really important. I'm going to say that again. If we never move things out of our own hands and into the hands of Jesus, then we'll never see them for what they could be. We'll never see them beyond ourselves. We'll never see the capacity for them to be great, not because of what we are or what we've given or been given, but because of whose hands we find them and we're placing them in. This boy never stopped to wonder whether or not this would work. He just knew that in the capable hands of Jesus, they would be much greater than they would be had he kept them all to himself. And so Jesus takes the bread and he takes the fish and he distributes it. And not only do they have enough for everyone to eat, like whatever they wanted, there's 12 baskets left over. And I, I think 
it's, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing because how many disciples are there? There are 12. It's interesting that, that this little boy uh, and what he had is enough for not just a little bit of leftovers for the disciples, but like baskets full. And afterwards, the people, they, they saw the sign that Jesus performed, it says. And they said, this is the prophet who's come into the world. And ultimately, because of the faith of this little boy, because this little boy saw what his loaves and fish could be in the hands of Jesus, other people began to see Jesus for who he was after that. You know, this story is not really about the little boy. It's about Jesus and about giving uh, him, him getting the glory in the midst of it. That in the midst of all that, this little boy just giving what he had was enough. Because he didn't see it in his own hands. He saw it in the hands of Jesus. So I wonder what stories we have. And like I said, we're, we're going to have a few videos that are going to highlight some of people's experience of, of this Serve Sunday that I invited people to be part of. And I hope that we'll do more of this and that we're encouraged in this. In saying, I, I, when I'm asked to serve in whatever capacity that might be, that I'm not looking from a scarcity standpoint. I'm not saying, hey, what don't I have here? What am I limited to here? But I'm saying, hey, when I take the small, little, insignificant that I have, that I am, and I put it in the hands of Jesus, does it become more? Does it become significant because of who he is? I, I, when I had first mentioned on social media about, um, about this serve day, I was really encouraged because one of our friends here and partners here at the branch uh, named Marsha, um, I have been so blessed by the relationship that I've had with Marsha. She's not always able to be in person with us, but um, she's an example to me, uh, just like this little boy, of what it means to take what we have and to put it in the hands of Jesus. You see, Marsha is an incredibly talented and gifted artist. And she just wants to take what God's given to her and use it to encourage others and to spread the love of Christ. And so one of the things that Marsha's been doing, which I've loved to be a, a, a partner with her on this, is that she's been using her gift of art to encourage uh, the teachers and staff over at Gandhi Elementary School. During some of the big uh, times of the year, Marsha will just do up a drawing or a painting and we'll bring it over to them with some treats and they'll leave it in their teacher break room for them to be able to enjoy. And it's been such an encouragement, not only for me to hear from the staff and teachers at Gandhi, but also for me to take Marsha and our friend Leslie as well to go and, and to deliver this to the school and, and to just see the joy that, you know, Marcia's taking what she's been given and she's putting it in the hands of Jesus. And she's saying, how can he use this to make a significant impact for his kingdom? And I, I love uh, what she had said when, when we were talking about um, this Surf Sunday. She, she had written on our Facebook page, I, I gave my neighbor a loaf of apple bread. She's in a wheelchair, and I listen for her often because she's fallen before. I still owe her a loaf of banana bread, and I'll pray for her. And then I, I was so struck by what she said after this. She said, she's the one God has chosen for me to show love. And I wonder whether, whether we've been so consumed with what we don't have so consumed with what we're scarce in that we miss who is right in front of us that God has said, they're the ones I want you to love. 
I, I want you to take what you have. I want you to put it in my hands. And then I want you to love those people right in front of me. Such a great month of giving. Honestly, um, December is just one of those times in our family when it's, it's very easy to give to other people. We had um, an extra cookie baking opportunity with baking for the Polar Express night at the branch. Um, for a decade and more, my girls have um, delivered cookies to our neighbors, and this year was no exception. It's always a great thing to um, pop in when maybe we haven't seen each other all year except in passing, waving on the driveway, waving while gardening, waving while they leave to go someplace. And yet, you know, Christmas Eve comes, and they can always expect that uh, that the J girls will be stopping by with some home-baked treats and uh, and it was just such a wonderful thing to be able to watch them go off on their own and then mom could serve by doing their dishes but uh, to then follow it up and and have this incredible snowfall that happened in January and to know that even though my neighbor has people who take care of her lawn she doesn't have people to take care of her snowy driveway so we're always happy to stop over there and get all the snow cleared off. It just makes it easier for her to be out and about and do the things that she enjoys. So it's been a really wonderful time. Hi, I'm Bob Mysall. And I'm Leslie Mysall. And we're here to share about um, a very special person in our lives. Uh, this didn't exactly all happen on December 26th. It's actually been going on for about almost three years now. Uh, a good friend of mine was led to serve a woman called Amy. Uh, she saw an article about her in the newspaper. It was actually a GoFundMe account request from Amy. Uh, and she reached out to her and brought along three friends, and I was one of them. And then we all brought along our husbands. And all of us have been friends with Amy since February of 2019. Amy is, uh, lives alone, is on her own, uh, is legally blind, and goes to dialysis three times a week. She also lives on the second floor of an apartment building on the West End near Costco, and she has to walk up and down the stairs to get to her apartment every day. Um, Amy has gone through a lot, physically, emotionally. Uh, she lost her husband to COVID. Um, there's just been a lot of hardship in her life. And in the beginning, it felt like it was a serving opportunity, and I'm usually up for something like that. But it's actually turned into so much more, because when you serve, you also receive, if you're doing it with your heart. If you're doing it, if you're spirit-led, you are doing it from your heart. And Amy and I have become very special friends. And uh, the week before Christmas, Bob and I, um, I usually bring her groceries to her every other week and she'll reimburse me for them. But this week we, we covered her groceries and also brought her some meals. And I hadn't seen Amy in a while, probably about six or eight, uh, six months. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the opportunity on a day that I wasn't working to join in. And I think Amy was more excited to see Bob than me. <laughs> she <laughs> adores him. Um, and Amy has just taught me so much about spiritual giving from the heart. She's taught me about faith, um, persistence, fortitude, strength. Um, she embodies all of these things. And uh, it doesn't feel like... I'm serving her it feels like we're serving each other and that's how God intends it to be it, it you think you're going into something almost as a chore and then if you open up your heart and let the spirit in it becomes so much more and that's how we both feel about Amy we just adore her uh, she calls me and checks in every single day so I know she's still amongst us amongst the living if I don't hear from her I call her just to make sure she's okay. And we've been keeping up that tradition every day for almost three years. She calls me every single day just to check in, even if it's just for five seconds, because oftentimes she's not feeling well, she checks in so I know she's okay. Um, 
there's so many opportunities there's so many people out there who need help who just want to be loved who just want to want someone there to talk to um, he, he God provides these things for us we just have to be open to them um, so that's our story about Amy who continues to be in our lives uh, we feel so blessed to know her and to have her as our friend yep we're graced to have Amy as a friend after the holidays, I was really looking forward to a break in the weather uh, because I had a lot of errands that I wanted to run. I had things that I was going to get to people and uh, I just needed a break in the weather. So it was good to be able to do that the other day. Um, and as I was preparing to go up to Ashland to make some deliveries, I was looking on my social media feed in the morning and noticed that a friend had posted that she needed some help clearing off some snow that was stuck on the top of her van. And I thought, well, you're one of the people I need to stop by and visit um, with this errand that I was doing. And so I thought, I, I will just let you know that um, I can help you with this. Uh, so I, I left her a message because she's not the kind of person that you just stop in on and um, and knock on the door. So I left her a message. I said, you know, I can I can help you when I drop off these items for you. Well, she didn't get back to me. Um, I decided I'm going to go ahead and and bring what I have uh, to help. Which in the end, after I went to my garage, I found out like I didn't have a whole lot of stuff to help her either. But I knew that. I was taller than she was, and so I probably could uh, at least try to knock some of the snow off the roof of her van so she could get out. So I, I headed up to Ashland, and I, I did the initial errands. I dropped off the things that I was going to drop off at her apartment, and um, and she still had not responded to the message I left. So I thought, well, okay, I'm just going to keep running my errands at Ashland. I had to go to the apartment complex that was next door, and I had some books that I was dropping off at a little free library there. Well, I got to the little free library and noticed it was a mess. They were, you know, how books get all kind of stacked up and you can't even drop off your own donations. So I took 10 minutes, a good 10 minutes, and I cleaned up the little free library that I was visiting just to make some more room so people could see the books that were in there and I could drop off my own donations. And I went back to my car and checked my phone and there was a message from my child's school. And so I needed to take another five minutes and just be on a phone call while I was there in the parking lot. And so I, I left and as I was stopped at a traffic light, still in Ashland, ping goes my phone and it's my friend with the snow on her van. And she said, yes, I could use some help. <laughs> and so I I'm turned around and uh, I, I was back in her subdivision in no time. And I, I just, I laugh because, you know, this is God's timing, right? Um, if, if he really wanted you to help her out, he was going to make a way before you got too far out of the city border. And, and so I went back and I met her in the parking lot. I think she was really surprised that I was still in the area. And, uh, and using the tools that uh, we had, her scraper and, and my brush, um, in you know, another 10 minutes or so, we were able to clean off her whole van and she was able to get her shopping done before um, what was supposed to be snow on Friday that didn't really come, but at least she was able to get out and she was able to get to the store. And um, it's, it's the little things, you know, uh, but how wonderful God's timing when could have gone on for many more errands, but he said, nope, I'm going to make it possible for you to go back right now and, and help her out and get her on her way. So uh, always be on alert because you never know when the Holy Spirit is going to ping you um, and, and cause an interruption in your direction to say, no, I have some place that I need you to serve. And uh, I, I was just so glad to be able to do that. And I hope that there'll be more stories, that you're working on stories of how God can use you. Not looking at things from a scarcity perspective, but from a, an abundance perspective. 
So what do we do with all this? I think three things to highlight for us in this. The first one is this. Give what you got. You know, look at what you have, not what you don't have. And the second thing is look beyond your own hands. If something seems small, if something seems insignificant, maybe it's because you're still looking at it in your own hands. You haven't transferred it yet and put it in God's hands. And then finally, after you give and you put something in God's capable hands, give Him the glory for it. You know, He loves to use His children to accomplish His kingdom's work. And what a privilege it is for us to do that. I hope and pray that we can continue to hear stories, we continue to share stories about this. And, and I hope that even in some of the stories we share today that, that we realize, you know, it's not about these huge, big, grand things because in God's hands, He can make anything huge and grand and marvelous. Let me pray for us. God, thank You for this time. Thank you for this word. Thank you that we don't have to ask, is it enough? When we look at the things that you've given us, God, we don't need to be about comparison. We don't need to be about uh, whether it's enough because, God, when we put it in your hands, your capable, strong, powerful, creator hands, that it's enough. So God, give us the courage to trust that what you have given us is enough to serve you. May we give it and see it not in our own hands, but in your hands. We pray in Jesus' name.